Welcome to the fourth session of, the, of our conference, the sixth Lemkin reunion titled Values in Retreat. Is the resurgence of transactional foreign policy hindering the prevention of mass atrocities, the promotion of the rule of law and the global response to COVID-19? I'm Al-Hakam Shaar, Holbrook Fellow for the Aleppo Project at the Shatik Center on Conflict, Negotiation and Recovery at Central European University's School of Public Policy. Each year, the Shattuck Center hosts the Lemkin Reunion, a gathering established in 2014 with the generous support of an anonymous donor. The reunion is named in honor of Raphael Lemkin, the Polish lawyer who, having lost his, most of his family in the Holocaust, coined the term genocide, and then campaigned tirelessly throughout his life to have it codified as international crime. The transactional approach to foreign policy threatens to make the world less secure. While no nations have adhered to all international norms and agreements all the time, a general respect for them, even between hardened adversaries, helped at least keep concern for human rights, a common one, and prevented the Third World War. Transactionalism, if uh, it pays off, brings little in terms of downside as regimes that uh, flout established norms benefit from these actions and don't face substantive consequences from the rest of the international community, they are likely to continue this behavior. It becomes a slippery slope as governments that have tradi traditionally played by the rules and adhered to heretofore shared values come to believe that continuing to do so puts them at a strategic disadvantage. A system in which a majority of the actors, or at least the most powerful ones, adopt a cynical approach, seeking advantage regardless of the cost, will be less stable and could spiral out of control. One technical note uh, for today's session, please submit your questions using the link to menti.com. Uh, you can also use the app uh, using the six digit number uh, provided. Um, uh, and uh, pay, pay attention to the descriptions in the instructions uh, in, the, in the description section below the YouTube bro uh, broadcast uh, to submit questions, that is. Uh, now, I'd like to introduce our panel chair, uh, Cameron Ashraf, Assistant Professor at the School of Public Policy and a human rights defender. In 2009, he assembled a team providing digital security and internet uh, censorship circumvention to democracy activists, journalists, and human rights defenders in authoritarian regimes. Cameron and his team defended critical websites from state-sponsored attacks, provided personal communications security to hundreds of vulnerable activists and journalists, distributed anti-censorship tools used by over 40,000 people daily, and enabled more than 3 million human rights video downloads from inside authoritarian states. Cameron is co-founder of international human rights and technology organization, Access Now, which was selected by the European Parliament as a finalist for the 2010 uh, uh, Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought, the European Union's highest human rights honor. Cameron, the panel is yours. Thanks, Hakam. Um, and first off, I want to say, uh, you know, congratulations to Ben, Kirsten, and Hakam for putting together this incredible uh, online conference. It's super inspiring during this, you know, really challenging global time, you know, global pandemic time um, that's been going on that they've been able to, you know, get such high quality speakers who are really talking about very interesting and pressing topics and put it together, so, you know, super smoothly. This has been just between you and me, this has been the, like the smoothest start to an event I've ever had. So it's really been fantastic. Um, and we've got a really important uh, conversation going on today on the security implications of transactional foreign policy. And the way it's going to go is I'm going to introduce the first speaker and then she's going to speak for a bit. And then I will introduce the other speakers so that we can, so we can, you can keep their backgrounds, you know, sort of at the top of your mind. And I encourage you as Hakam did to actually, you know, submit questions using the mentee link that should be on your screen. Um, so, if, but if you do have a problem, you know, you can contact the tech people who are helping us with this. Um, anyway, enough about that. Uh, this is going to be a really exciting session and I'm really glad you're here. Our first speaker is Marina Vorotniuk, 
Um, I hope I pronounced that correctly. And uh, she's a researcher here at Central European University's Center for European Neighborhood Studies and works on security developments in the Black Sea region, Ukrainian and Turkish foreign policy, and the Southern Caucasus. Dr. Vorotnyuk has taken part in many programs, namely the EU Eastern Partnership and Civil Society Fellowship, High Level Experts Program of the German Foreign Office, National Security Policymaking Institute of the US State Department, and a lot more very high profile work. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to say. And I ask all of you to give her a warm welcome, you know, from home, as warm as you can, um, as she begins her talk right now. So Marina, it's all you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you, Cameron, for the introduction and for the invitation to speak. I feel very humbled now to be opening this panel discussion with the topic I work on, the Black Sea security. Uh, I believe this is a very crucial hotspot at the moment, uh, as the title of my presentation suggests, full of security deadlocks. Uh, when we experts working on the region refer to the security uh, situation here, we usually use the terms volatile, fragmented, fractured. So this is clearly denotes what kind of security situation is here at the, at the moment. And that is very complex, that there are lots of overlapping and diverging security interests here in the region. There are active and dormant conflicts. And see, even though NATO since 2004 uh, is present here after Romania and Bulgaria became the members of the alliance, it, uh, uh, there is a general recognition that it did not really become a full-fledged Black Sea security actor in the terms of uh, that, that the region still remained an, a very much overlooked uh, blind uh, blind spot, blind security blind spot. Uh, of course, 2008, the Russian-Georgian war was a very important warning at the moment, which still was perceived as something very marginal to the interests of majority of European states and NATO members. And 2014, probably this, this was the game changer. This was the very important moment. And this was the moment when Russia next Crimea and later started to sponsor the war in Ukraine and Donbass. So if you speak now about the maritime dimension, of course, it's also very important to uh, remember that in 2018, also there was uh, uh, an additional, let's say, conflagration when uh, Russia tried to limit the navigation in the Azov Sea. So the, in, also basically spreading the conflict uh, with Ukraine to, to this very important also body of water. Uh, so in short, uh, what I'm going to speak about, that the Black Sea is, region is a very important playground for Russia and West uh, confrontation at the moment. This is the region where Russia openly uh, challenges uh, NATO and has chosen to test NATO's resolve, resolve in its eastern flank uh, by the open use of force. And uh, even if we compare the NATO and Russian conventional forces, of course, we see the clear asymmetry in favor of NATO. But in this region, there is a clear recognition by the majority of experts that Russia gained the comparative advantages, strategic advantages. Uh, thus, it can effectively uh, implement its strategy of denial. The denial strategy means that it can effectively deny the, its former satellite or regional actors from, uh, from the moves to join or to be active part of the Western institutions. And it also can deny the right for NATO to set the security agenda uh, in the region. Uh, Russian approach is based on the desire to compartmentalize the agenda with the West. The topic of this panel and the security in general is transactionalism, and I think this approach clearly manifests itself in the region through Russian approach to, uh, to check whether the West is susceptible to this transactionalist mode of interaction. So when basically the Russian-Western uh, interactions uh, 
are reduced to mere uh, profit-seeking uh, transactions, or let's say Russia attempts to, 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 to do that. And uh, that, that means that Russia tries to create additional dossiers all the time by, by basically inciting some additional uh, conflict thoughts and uh, try to offer to the West uh, itself as an indispensable player to solve these issues. Uh, so this is, uh, I think, the strategy that uh, Western powers and, and NATO, I'm speak, speaking a lot today about NATO, should uh, uh, resolutely resist uh, to. Uh, there is, I, I think I belong to the group of experts who believe that, uh, that uh, this kind of idea that uh, the West should engage less in the region, and this will kind of pacify Russia and uh, bring some reconciliation. Uh, that this this is the solution. I think this is wrong. Uh, this, on the contrary, I think it proves that it emboldens Russia and it uh, even calls for more uh, assertive actions. Uh, in the very beginning, from 90s, early 2000s, I think. Uh, we also saw that Russian uh, uh, Russian uh, strategy to unilaterally, single-handedly set the agenda in the region did not really match with its political, economic, or security cloud. But with even weaker position of its former satellites here, or respectful self-withdrawal of Turkey from the region, or general disinterest of the West to meddle into this, what was perceived as Russian sphere of interest, this brought more assertive Russia as we see it uh, today. A very considerable number of papers analyzed what exactly happened after Crimea uh, was annexed by Russia, what kind of comparative advantages, strategic advantages Russia gained, and usually those papers refer to uh, the uh, A2AD system that Russia managed to create over the northern part of the region, anti-access area denial uh, system or bubble as it's called, that basically uh, effectively cuts off the NATO from more efficient uh, military engagement in the region and makes uh, NATO partners such as Georgia or Ukraine who are openly now trying uh, to aspire for the NATO membership, it makes them practically indefensible. And this is, I think, the major challenge that uh, that uh, is, uh, is on the agenda at the moment. And Crimea, of course, in short, not to go into much details, is a very important uh, fort post for the power projection for Russia. To the Mediterranean as a receive active uh, engagement and uh, and uh, wider. So besides this military aspect I've mentioned, military intimidation, probing, uh, Russia also uses other extensive uh, like toolkits from uh, using its uh, energy transportation routes to the region as a means to uh, assert its control over the region. Plus, of course, uh, many uh, economic uh, resources, disinformation, warfare, political pressure, export of corruption is a very noteworthy uh, topic here. So, uh, what about NATO and what it's doing in the region? Uh, it's very important that, as I mentioned, 2014 became this kind of uh, game changer. And in, at, uh, in 2014, after the Belt Summit, NATO uh, resorted to strengthening this, this uh, flank by introducing the tailored forward presence. Uh, and, but uh, uh, the experts uh, generally note that the enhanced, uh, the tailored forward presence uh, tailored for the Black Sea region uh, is generally, let's say, it pales next uh, to the enhanced forward, forward presence that NATO devised for uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and Poland. Uh, that there is a significant capabilities gap between uh, between the two uh, 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 two policies, and 
even so, NATO is present, of course, we should acknowledge through this tailored war presence in the region in three domains by, uh, by the air policing mission in Bulgaria, Romania, by the multinational brigade in Romania, and rotational presence of NATO ships in the uh, black, uh, black sea waters. But still, uh, the kind of asymmetry of engagement with Russia is very, uh, I think, is a very serious problem. problem. Besides that, there is a Montreux Convention that uh, shortly limits the uh, the presence of uh, ships here in the region of non-literal states, basically of all uh, NATO member states ships apart uh, beside, uh, apart from Turkey, Bulgaria, and Romania, and. Uh, finally, uh, the question I want to stop on is that uh, there is a very well documented and recognized problem of lack of, uh, uh, let's say, uniform approach on uh, within NATO to the region and to Russia in particular. And I think that the Black Sea region is an embodiment in miniature of this problem because there are three NATO allies uh, in the region, Turkey, Bulgaria, Romania. And sometimes there is, not sometimes, but in general, there is such a uh, divergent, let's say, discrepancy in the views, in among their views, that, uh, for example, Romania, who is believed to be the biggest NATO enabler in the region, finds more common language and, and uh, reciprocity from Ukraine or Georgia rather than from other allies from Romania or Bulgaria. Uh, so the positions are very different. Uh, we, we, we have uh, Turkey here in the region who has a very cautious approach to NATO being more active here, who usually speaks about, uh, about uh, regional co-ownership in security terms, which uh, in, in uh, Turkish terms means that NATO basically should stay away and all extra regional players should stay away from the region. Turkey is here to guarantee the security. It can do so, it believes, in the condominium with Russia. So this is a very long strategic tradition here uh, on uh, of Turkish security and foreign policies. We see uh, Turkey being condemning the annexation of Crimea, on the other hand, not uh, exceeding to the anti-Russian sanctions that West imposed on Russia, buying the S-400 uh, systems from Russia, which clearly caused a very huge discomfort on NATO's part, the NATO, NATO member is buying the Russian systems, and uh, many other indications that there is a rift within, uh, Tur between Turkey and other uh, NATO allies. Uh, at the moment. Uh, Bulgaria, Romania, as I mentioned, Romania is considered to be now one of the biggest, let's say, best uh, uh, and NATO promoters, enablers in the region. Uh, it, uh, it, it was the one who advocated for the creation of, uh, uh, of uh, D9 initiative, Bucharest 9, and it was the one uh, who is very uh, uh, articulate now in uh, uh, saying that Russian assertiveness is detrimental to the interests of the uh, of the regional uh, uh, states, and is believed to be, by some uh, terms, uh, the mainly Russia proof um, uh, in, in the region. And finally, Bulgaria, who has displayed during a certain amount of time already uh, the a certain duality in scoring the security policies oscillating between NATO and uh, uh, Russia, which is, I believe, some kind of derivative of its dependence on Russia in terms of energy, business, tourism. So, uh, to sum up and to finish, uh, is that we really see certain vulnerabilities inherent in the region. Uh, not all of them are linked necessarily or purely or merely to Russian revisionism. There are lots of problems that uh, are inherent to domestic uh, political constellation within these countries. 
uh, certain vulnerabilities, but as I, I, I focus mainly on that, uh, that what kind of uh, detrimental security situation is here in the region after 2014. And of course, the general recommendation, the one who work on the topic, they know that basically it's believed to be that NATO should not really refrain or abstain from be, becoming more uh, um, actively uh, engaged and should take this kind of discrepancies uh, into account, trying to, to mainly defend uh, the bridges between the uh, individual NATO allies in the region. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Marina, for that very fascinating talk on such an important topic. Um, that's what makes this event so exciting. Hopefully, yeah, microphone is on, good. That's what makes the event so exciting is that we're actually being able to hear things that are happening, you know, sort of at the front lines, the cutting edge of everything. So thank you, Marina. And now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is John Lee Candelaria. He's a PhD student at the Graduate School for International Development and Cooperation at Hiroshima University in Japan. He finished his BA and MA in history from the University of the Philippines in Diliman, and his research interests include international relations, peace and conflict studies, heritage studies, and Philippine and Southeast Asian history. So I think your name is listed as Lee. Do you prefer Lee or John? Yeah, you can call me Lee. Okay, Lee. Well, apologies then, Lee. Well, now it's now Lee, now it's up to you. Thank you, Cameron. Let me just share my presentation. Okay, um, my paper is titled uh, With Their ASEAN Centrality, The Effects of Duterte's Foreign Policy in ASEAN. So from the Black Sea region, we come to Southeast Asia. I played with the homonyms of whither, which means to what place or to which, referring to an attempt to situate the concept of ASEAN centrality and whither, which means to decay, to decline or to deteriorate, which refers to the state of ASEAN centrality vis-a-vis the regional security architecture of Southeast Asia as a region. Just a bit of a background on the ASEAN. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations was founded in 1967. Today, it is a regional intergovernmental organization of 10 Southeast Asian countries. It has been hailed for its success in minimizing interstate conflict in the region through its principles of consensus and non-interference and its decision-making style termed as the ASEAN way. However, an essential criticism on the ASEAN was its inability to make a substantial dent in the South China Sea dispute, where Southeast Asian claimant states such as the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Brunei clash with China, who claims historical control of the entire sea. In 2013, the Philippine government lodged a complaint against China in the Permanent Court of Arbitration under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Days before the Philippines won the arbitration case in 2016, a new Philippine president, Rodrigo Duterte, was elected. He refused to uphold the ruling, citing a new brand of foreign policy that intends to pursue bilateral talks with China instead. This independent foreign policy had profound effects on ASEAN centrality in the South China Sea dispute. This presentation aims to situate Duterte's foreign policy, which I argue is transactional, and assess how it affects Asian, ASEAN's capacity to assert its centrality in the region. To do that, I want to discuss first Duterte's rise in Philippine politics. Many scholars branded his platform and policies as penal or punitive populist, which refers to his campaign against criminality. Comparisons were drawn with other leaders such as Trump, Le Pen, Bolsonaro, Orban, among others. He has been described as a local strongman, a fascist original that distilled his authoritarian fantasies from his local government experience. And to a certain extent, he's also a conservative in that he preserved the socioeconomic hierarchy existing in the Philippines before his election. I hope to add to these existing analyses of the Duterte's leadership by saying that he is also transactionalist and his foreign policy echoes his domestic policies as well. Duterte's foreign policy has been known to break tradition. He argues through insults, curses, and generally uncouth and brazen words that he is not beholden to anyone not even the local and foreign institutions that have been deemed sacrosanct. A key identifier of his foreign policy is a changing attitude towards China, which effectively unraveled his predecessor's foreign policy agenda. He has been vocal in pursuing an independent foreign policy by separating from the United States 
and moving closer to China and Russia to maximize the benefit, benefits of close ties to these countries. All these inclinations indicate the Tete's foreign policy as transactionalist. As Bashirov and Ilmas defined, a transactionalist foreign policy favors bilateral to multilateral relations, focuses on short-term wins rather than longer-term strategic foresight, adheres to a zero-sum worldview where all gains are relative and reciprocity is absent, rejects value-based policymaking, does not follow a grand strategy, and is personalist, which is connected to domestic political considerations, which prioritize political gain. We see these qualifiers manifest in Duterte and his foreign policy. He cursed the United Nations, insulted Obama, the Pope, and international institutions that criticize him. He took the Philippines out of the international criminal court to assert that he will not be bound by international instruments that condemn his human rights records. He believes investments from China could fund his ambitious infrastructure program and his closeness with Xi Jinping could score him brownie points as access to China's deep coffers would enable him to carry out his expensive platforms. He, termed the, he terminated the Philippines Visiting Forces Agreement with the United States only to suspend the termination when the tension in the South China Sea rose. When the COVID-19 pandemic started, he initially refused to close doors on flights from China, arguing that it is not wise to alienate China, the Chinese. Yet today, he hopes China will come to the country's aid as COVID-19 cases skyrocket in the Philippines, currently one of the highest in Southeast Asia. He has maintained a zero-sum worldview by arguing that the Philippine nation's only recourse is to befriend the Chinese lest we risk going to war with China, a war Filipinos could never win. This friendship entails allowing China access to the Philippines' exclusive economic zone, such as the Philippine rice. Yet domestically, Duterte maintains unprecedented popularity through populist policies, such as making college edu education free, a tax reform package that eased income taxes for low-income earners, while continuing a lawless war on drugs and the suppressing press of press freedom by forcing the closure of major media outlets and enabling the filing of cases against journalists such as Maria Reza. Just recently, Duterte's anti-terrorism bill, which was signed in, uh, to law today, incidentally, um, was criticized as it could be weaponized by the state to target its critics. Duterte's splashy domestic policies ensure his popularity while maintaining a surgical move against sectors that do not support him and provides against sectors uh, and provides him the capital, the political capital, to continue pursuing a transactionalist foreign policy. What are the effects of this transactional foreign pol policy on ASEAN centrality? First, we have to situate ASEAN centrality. It is enshrined in the ASEAN Charter and signifies the need for the ASEAN to play a central role in multinational frameworks in the Asia-Pacific region. ASEAN must remain the core of regional processes and institutional designs in the Asia-Pacific. Which, which it hopes to do so through ASEAN cooperation with other countries such as Japan, Korea, China, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. However, we see this centrality withers in the wake of Duterte's transactionalist foreign policy. Duterte's predecessor has asserted and advocated the ASEAN to be involved as a bloc to negotiate with China. Duterte's downplaying of the arbitration ruling only served to dilute this effort slowing down the momentum building within ASEAN on the dispute. This was very much apparent in the 2017 ASEAN summit hosted by Manila as ASEAN chair that year. Other Southeast Asian claimants now stand alone in fending off Chinese excursions to their respective exclusive economic zones. Yet, a fuller picture must also be painted to see how this centrality has been withering even before Duterte. The ASEAN way has been criticized as ineffective since it prioritizes consensus, consensus building and paralyzes the ASEAN's ability to act decisively. In fact, this wither wither question has been an enduring paradox among ASEAN scholars. What makes it more difficult for the ASEAN is that countries such as Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar have extant and robust ties with China. The consensus among the 10 countries is therefore, and has always been, impossible to reach among ASEAN countries. Duterte's foreign policy only served to add insult to the injury as what was once seen as a Southeast Asian leader of the PAC in the South China Sea is now outwardly 
unwilling to pursue its interests in the region. To conclude, I'd like to take stock of the current developments in the South China Sea dispute. The past few months have seen a rise in China's militarization and aggression in the South China Sea, seemingly taking advantage as claimant countries are looking away to, uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The United States has not been idle and also ramped up corresponding joint military exercises, potentially in hopes of creating deterrence in the region. Last month, Indonesia cited the Philippines' victory against China at the Permanent Court of Arbitration, the first country to make a case for the award since it was won in 2016. And a few days ago, current ASEAN chair Vietnam released a statement that pundits hailed as a significant shift for the organization's assertion of centrality in the region. But the statement doesn't really say anything, doesn't really say anything new that the ASEAN has not raised before. Amid these developments, the Duterte's transactional foreign policy is still at play. As Chinese military aggression in the South China Sea um, increases, he suddenly uh, suspended the termination of the visiting forces agreement with the United States. Yet, Duterte still aims to maintain a cordial relationship with Beijing, hoping that the much needed funds to recover from the pandemic could be sourced from China, where the pandemic itself originated. Duterte remains unwilling to earn the ire of China and has been very careful with his words, something he has struggled um, in doing when talking about other issues. All this indicates that at the end of the day, Duterte has no grand strategy, a hallmark of transactionalism and a transactionalist foreign policy. Yet his foreign policy continues to dilute ASEAN centrality in the region. So thank you. And uh, I'm looking forward to a good discussion later. Thanks a lot, Lee, for that great presentation. And it's, it's so good to get a perspective from Southeast Asia and from East Asia as well, so that we can contextualize transactionalism globally. So it doesn't become sort of locked into sort of regionalism or associated exclusively with certain parts of the world so that we can see this as a broader trend Right, and understand that the actions that we take to sort of to address the issues, even regionally, will have impacts globally. So thank you so much for that, Lee. Excuse me, and I want to remind everybody, you know, if you have questions for Lee, um, and you if you have questions for Marina so far, please submit them, you know, using the mentee link that should be uh, and you follow the instructions below. And I can't see the below, but the rumor is it's below. So please use mentee to get some questions in there. We've already got a lot of great questions, and I'm looking forward. Uh, to discussing them with you once we're done with today's speakers. So again, now uh, we will go on to the next speaker, who is Cheryl Collins. Uh, she's a professional freelance editor and writer and an infrequent journalist with a wonderful phrase. Uh, she recently attended CEU where her thesis concerned Russian organized crime as a foreign policy tool. And incidentally, actually, uh, that is also a foreign policy tool in the cyber realm, which is where well, you know, the things that I teach and research about. Um, so she, anyways, she's had an atypical career, careening from working as a copy editor at an encyclopedia to a radio producer to a jazz club cocktail waitress and beyond. So let's give Cheryl a warm welcome with that very exciting background. And I look forward to her talk. And again, if you have questions for Cheryl, Lee, or Marina, please use the mentee link and submit your questions. And we'll get to them at the end of today's session. And it's all yours, Cheryl. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And I'd like to thank the uh, Lemkin reunion for this lovely invitation. I so appreciate being invited along with these very uh, prestigious uh, fellow presenters and esteemed guests. Um, as Cameron noted, I come not as an IR or even public policy expert, as an, but as a non-academic who recently spent a brief year at CEU and tried to absorb what I could. And um, I'm most interested in this notion of Russian soft power. So what is that? The notion of Russian soft power may seem an unlikely or even paradoxical concept as from its inception, soft power has been identified with liberal Western values. And over time, it came to be considered a powerful force against perceived illiberal powers such as Russia. But I would suggest that Russia does have soft power tools that are outside the bounds of the way soft power is traditionally defined. And this includes what the West would call organized crime. So what's soft power? Well, since Joseph Nye first discussed and popularized the concept in 1990, 
soft power has been associated with Western values. And his idea, of course, is that strength is based on the power of attraction and the attractiveness of intangibles such as values and culture. Because Nye's concept of soft power emerged as the Soviet Union was disintegrating, it immediately gained traction as a policy concept in the post-Cold War world, as the West tried to influence and project power in the new world order. So how did the West use soft power? Well, Western nations and institutions saw the instrumentalization of soft power as especially useful in the former Soviet Union and Eastern and Central Europe, for example. To advance the Western liberal model, Western institutions and states often relied on non-state actors to expand its norms and values. The US, EU, International Monetary Fund, foundations and think tanks funded groups and organization in the new states to affect change. Non-state actors such as non-governmental organizations rose in prominence as the Cold War ended, empowered by the forces that Professor Shattuck spoke of during the keynote session. These factors include the lowering of barriers between states, the erasing of ideological borders, the increased ease of communication, continuously lowering long distance travel costs, as well as the personal computer revolution, of course, which allows for the instant transmission of information, ideas, images, and money. All these led to an explosion of the number and reach of non-state actors from the 1990s, which were then used by the West to operationalize soft power. One key component of the soft power effort was funneling money to NGOs involved in democracy promotion efforts. The West's instrumentalization of soft power came as the ability of the Russian state to exercise power both internally and externally was at its lowest. Through the 1990s and 2000s, of course, Western military and economic power steadily advanced eastward through NATO and EU expansion and the color revolutions. After the Orange Revolution in Ukraine in 2004, for example, the Kremlin blamed Western funded non-state actors perceiving that the true objective of democracy promotion was subversion and regime change. They saw, the Kremlin saw these events as the result of a Western directed quote, NGO special operation as a source close to the Kremlin noted. So what is Russian soft power? In response to the color revolutions, Russia built its own soft power arsenal with tools that often copied the Western ones institutions that promoted Russian language, cultural foundations, popular culture products, NGOs. Some were more effective than others. Yet the Kremlin had access to other non-traditional soft power tools. I would argue that one critical component of the Russian state that is most savvy and effective at using non-traditional soft power tools in the former Soviet Union are its criminal networks. These networks have been used by the Russian state to advance its goals, including foreign policy objectives. I'll briefly discuss the relationship of the criminal networks to the Russian state, which I could go into at length, but because I find it interesting, but I'll just try to skip ahead. Criminal, criminologist Mark Galeotti tra traces much of the current interplay between organized crime and the state to the gulag system when thousands of persons pass through the camps. The professional hardened criminal caste called the Vor had its own rules and rituals. One of the most important was that you never cooperate with the state. But by the end of World War II, the administrators of the camps came to rely on collaborators to maintain order. A war raged for years, it's called the Bitches War. And in the end, bitches, that is the collaborators, won. So as soon as Stalin died in 1953, the system began to be dismantled, doors open, and the collaborators were among the first who emerged. Thus, the thieves code, which dictated that one never worked for the state, morphed into the bitches code, that, fun coll that collaboration with the state was acceptable only if there was a benefit. Again, you don't serve the state unless you receive something back. Galeotti, who's a very esteemed criminologist, considers this to be, quote, Stalin's toxic legacy as a ramification of this ethos, as well as the relationship between the state and professional criminals had profound implications. So we'll speed ahead to um, the 90s. This 
um, by the time the Soviet Union dissolved, the criminal networks had solidified pos their position. They were entrepreneurial, organized, efficient, connected to those in power and with access to capital. They also provided a critically important service as state assets were dismantled and sold off. Money management, the criminal organizations could launder funds and move them to safe havens in the West. So countries on the periphery of the old West Warsaw Pact countries with stable banking systems, such as Hungary and Austria, were key midpoints for moving money, people, and good, goods. After Putin ascended to power in 2000, he sought to rein in the vast and expanding criminal networks, just as he had with the oligarchs. Putin reportedly offered a working agreement. He would not interfere with their criminal activities as long as the Kremlin could use them when needed, and they did not challenge the state's own power. In essence, the more sophisticated gangster businessmen grew more enmeshed with the state. The state, in effect, renationalized the most efficient criminal organizations in a vertical criminal integration. As Galeotti has noted, the boundaries between business, politics, and crime was, as be was at best hazy, at most meaningless. And further, the tools and attitudes of organized crime came to permeate the system as a whole. Putin found use for the criminal networks beyond Russian borders as a de facto auxiliary wing of Russian intelligence services. They could collect intelligence, conduct cybercrime operations, generate black cash or operational funds for active measures abroad and serve as agents of influence, as well as a force, more multiplier, force multiplier on the ground. The growth of organized crime and specifically organized crime of the former Soviet Union can be seen in parallel to the growth of Western-based NGOs and other non-state actors. The criminal networks benefited and profited by the same accelerating technological advances as the Western-backed non-state actors had, allowing money and information to travel much faster and opening up new markets and leading to a truly transnational, leading to truly transnational crime organizations. I'm running out of time here, so I'll just skip ahead to say, in short, the values-based approach of the West is operationalized by instruments of Western soft power, whereas the transactional approach of Russia is operationalized by instruments of Russian, Russian soft power, including its criminal networks. Awesome, thank you, Cheryl, so for a very interesting take on Russian soft power. And you know, it's, it's quite interesting to me because you know, sort of working in, in somewhat a similar area, you know, we often hear, we hear a lot about Chinese soft power but Russian soft power is, you know, often sort of uh, minimized when we focus on sort of, you know, Crimea, Georgia, you know, these sorts of things. So it's a really great, it's really great and important, you know, to have a broader vision of what's going on in the situation there. So anyway, thank you. And again, I want to remind everybody, if you have questions for Cheryl, to please use the mentee link and submit them. And we will get to your questions after our last speaker, who, who is coming up in just a moment. And you, and you follow the mentee instructions down below. Our final speaker today is Julia Buxton, who is a region head for Latin America at the political risk firm Oxford Analytica, a senior research fellow at the Global Drug Policy Observatory at the University of Swansea, and a professor of comparative politics at Central European University School of Public Policy, where the Shattuck Center is and where I'm at. She specializes in drugs, development, gender, and security with expertise in the Andes. Mm -hmm. Her recent, some of her recent publications in, on Venezuela include Continuity and Change in Venezuela's Bolivarian Revolution in Third World Quarterly, Diffusing and Diffusing Venezuela in the Seton Hall Journal of Diplomacy and International Relations. So uh, I'm looking forward to what Julia has to say, and I will turn it over to her. And again, if you have questions for Julia or anybody else who's gone before her, please use the mentee link, and we will get to them after Julia. Julia, it's all yours. Thank you, Cameron. Um, this is probably going to be my, my last presentation at Central European University, given my imminent departure. So many thanks to Lemkin for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, and on the topic of moving away from things, um, I don't speak very much on Venezuela these days, mainly because the large number of Venezuelans who are overseas take great offence at uh, 
foreigners critiquing the Venezuelan opposition movement, unless, of course, it's Donald Trump or Americans who support the Venezuelan opposition movement. So just to contextualize my work on Venezuela, I've been working on Venezuela since the mid 1990s when I did my Ph.D., in and on Venezuela. And at the time I was looking at a radical outsider, a populist who was kind of very much an anti-party actor. Nobody thought they could possibly take power. Um, and I was fascinated. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to go to Venezuela and research this individual. Anyway, as it happened, this individual uh, lost the presidential election, collapsed in opinion polls, um, and she was overtaken uh, by a man called Hugo Chavez, who I then spent the remaining 20 years following and studying. Um, so that's just to contextualize my talk on Venezuela, because to date, most of the discussions that uh, we've had through the Lemkin reunion sessions has focused very much on national governments um, and most obviously the US, which is a huge particular salience when discussing Venezuela. Um, by way of a quick recap, and just so I can position my comments, when we uh, started the Lemkin uh, reunion, we had Shatter, John Shatter, Michael Ignatieff, Ned Temko, who were talking about this transactional shift and this notion of a very brief and benign period of liberal interventionism in the 1990s, and democracies, including the US, being able to act collectively to assert this responsibility to protect and uphold human rights. Now, in that opening session, it was acknowledged that there has been a more recent and regrettable shift towards transactionalism, which was really defined in those opening sessions as a foreign policy which, based, which was based around national or increasingly individual elite gain. Um, and this is something that's not necessarily new, that was acknowledged, but what has been a, a big cause of concern and what was discussed in the opening sessions uh, was how this more recent and overt jettisoning of moral and ethical narratives of foreign policy and defense of universal rights has really accelerated. Now, my interest here is threefold. First of all, I'd like to reposition transactionalism, as it were, um, and really place this more at the heart of longstanding US foreign policy. And to be clear that any window of benign moral universalism that was opened up in the 1990s with the responsibility to protect only applied to a select few countries for a condensed moment in time. If you were living in Latin America, if you were a Latin American country, then your experience of this assumed benign period in US foreign policy was very, very different. And that links very much to the Monroe Doctrine of the 1820s, which sets out very clearly that Latin America is within the US sphere of influence. So I would argue very strongly that transactionalism has been really central to US foreign policy in Latin America for decades, if not centuries. So the idea that somehow the 1990s was a big shift, I really don't see occurring in the same way in, La in Latin America for reasons I'll outline. The second aspect of my uh, very brief talk on uh, transactionalism in Venezuela is also about putting resources and economics back at the center of the discussion around transactionalism. Um, and here Venezuela is hugely important because of its oil economy. And this oil economy in Venezuela's petro diplomacy has provided opportunities for very many different forms of transactionalism for a succession of Venezuelan governments. And the third thing I'd like to emphasize um, is that I think transactionalism needs to move away from state centric norms, that transactional foreign policy is only something that national governments do. And I think it's very important to highlight that opposition movements are also adept at utilizing and mobilizing a transactional foreign policy agenda. And these overtures to foreign powers occur when these opposition movements are looking for support in electoral or regime change processes. And I think this transactionalism in opposition movements really needs to be better appreciated and understood because this is not simply about nation states acting um, in a kind of vacuum in which opposition movements in other countries um, have no agency. What this generates and what this has generated in Venezuela, I would argue, is a deeply problematic trade-off between domestic grassroots political concerns and what an opposition movement, which is very largely based overseas, have committed their countries to in exchange for regime change support from foreign powers. So what I'm saying here is that transactionalism by the US, which has been overbearingly influential in Venezuela and Latin America, but also by the Venezuelan opposition movement has created a form of political agenda that doesn't necessarily have domestic grassroots political resonance within Venezuela. So transactionalism can lead to a detachment of opposition movements from what are perceived to be their natural and necessary domestic political support bases.
So just to go back to try and elaborate these three points, um, firstly, just to say that Venezuela-US bilateral relations have been forged by transactionalism. Um, I would argue that in a wider sense, in terms of foreign policy interests, uh, bilateral foreign capital interests, rather than that transactionalism necessarily uh, being around individual uh, financial gains and opportunities to gain. But the discovery of oil and the opening up of the country to US foreign investment occurred in the 1920s was when Venezuela first discovered its oil. And what was hugely important is that Venezuela had a very early model of rentier exploitation, which meant that very basically the country only charged investors for the a rent for the land in which they were going to be drilling for oil. Venezuela never charged American corporations for the actual oil they drilled, only a, only a rent for the land. And so from a very early stage, we had a very high foreign private sector dominance of oil companies, US oil companies uh, in Venezuela, Standard, Creole, and also uh, Royal Dutch Shell, um, Europe and the Brits certainly um, don't get away from being ignored from this story. Um, but these bilateral US-Venezuelan relations were configured around access to Venezuela's oil and what was the most appropriate form of governance for the Venezuelan oil sector. Now, during the Second World War, there was a shift in Venezuela towards a new 50-50 profit sharing agreement. Uh, this was imposed more costs, uh, detracting more profit from US private sector oil companies. But what's absolutely crucial here is that in this post-war period, the United States permitted Venezuela enormous foreign policy autonomy. So in stark contrast to countries like Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, which all had these horrific US-backed right-wing anti-communist military dictatorships, Venezuela was completely separate. Its democratic, nominally democratic political system was able to function because Venezuela guaranteed continued security of strategically important oil reserves and operational autonomy for US oil companies within Venezuela. Venezuelan governments were able to structure a very positive sum game, 1970s, very, very high international oil prices. So they were able to trade off, well, bring together, as it were, sorry, elite and kind of worker interests and the interests of the US oil companies. So there was no zero sum game during this time. It was a very, very positive relationship. And what's crucial here is that Venezuela was able to pursue a radical foreign policy. The US allowed them to do this, something which would have been unconscionable for Chile, unconscionable for Argentina. So what you see is Venezuela was able to use its oil, its petro diplomacy, um, its kind of heavy crude transactionalism to serve as one of the founders of OPEC in 1961. Venezuela has always had close ties to Arab states, to Iran, to Middle Eastern countries, whatever Fox News tells you today, these have been long established historical ties dating right back to the 1960s. Venezuela supported non-aligned countries. There was an unofficial FARC, the Colombian uh, rebel group, FARC embassy in Caracas before the current period of en enormous contestation be between the US and Venezuela. Venezuela funded with Mexico, subsidized fuel exports to Caribbean and Central American countries. The Venezuelan government of Jaime Lucinchi in the 1980s railed against the Ronald Reagan administration at a dinner hosted by Reagan, criticizing the US for its appalling human rights abuses in Latin America and on the social costs of neoliberalism. This context is important because it changes dramatically when Hugo Chavez is elected in 1998. Venezuelan foreign policy, I would argue, remained one of continuity. When Hugo Chavez came to power, he cited Tony Blair as his role model. He was uh, emphasizing Anthony Giddens' version of third way socialism, halfway between the markets um, and halfway between state intervention. And what Chavez sought to change, I would argue, was a state structure and political system dominated by an unpopular corrupt elite, which had been in power for 60 years. Now, the reason why I think this is important to emphasize is that Chavez wanted to break with this traditional model of bilateralism with the United States and have more multilateral relations with countries like China. And why not? Because at this point in the 2000s, China was a very attractive opportunity for investment and very, very central to the vision of a, a new multipolar world order. But the problem for Venezuela is that this goes against the Monroe, Monroe Doctrine. So this is where I go back now to this apparent sunlit moment of R2P um, and this benign democratic period, Democrat period in US foreign policy of the 1990s. The experience of liberal internationalism and democratic deepening for Latin America 
was very much policed by the United States. So people in Europe might have been hugely optimistic about this notion in the 1990s of US responsibility to protect and the promotion of a, an integrated global world order. As John Shattuck said the other day, democratization wave, it was this euphoric opportunity, democracy was the only game in town. But in Latin America, the context was hugely different. In Latin America at this point in the 1990s, there was enormous frustration with uh, the Washington consensus, with this US-backed neoliberalism, with very, very limited and contained transitions back to democracy. So this democratic moment was actually one of enormous ideological constraint for many Latin American countries. So what I would argue here is that US foreign policy during this period of the 1990s was fundamentally transactional, not necessarily in a private individual sense, although certainly in the sense of US foreign capital and investment interests in Latin America. The transactionalism was implicitly embedded in the Washington consensus and the neoliberal economic shift that Latin American countries undertook in the 1990s. The notion at this point in time of human rights being absolutely central was embedded in Latin America and US policing of Latin American democracy in a very, very narrow, limited and liberal democratic vision of what constituted democracy for this region. So I would say that what, what, what happened as a result of this is that the discourse of human rights, the discourse of democracy in Latin America amongst emerging grassroots organizations, which ultimately became the pink tide of radical political change in this region, there was a disconnect, disconnect between the language of the US and what the grassroots popular sentiment was on the ground in Latin America. So just to bring me very quickly to the Venezuelan opposition, I've written extensively about the many, many failings of the Venezuelan opposition. Um, this doesn't by default make me a communist, um, as seems to be the case in this deeply polarized world. It means that I think we should be able to critically interrogate the many and multiple failings of the Venezuelan opposition movement. The Venezuelan opposition movement has very little experience of being a loyal opposition. It's been from the start since 1998 when Chavez was elected, able and positioned to mobilize beltway contacts, elite and media networks in the United States, Human Rights Watch, the anti-Cuba lobby, US representatives in, in Miami, and hide what has been on the part of the Venezuelan opposition, quite extraordinarily undemocratic behavior. And this has been hidden behind a language of human rights and hidden behind a language of democratic defense and an almost mythical and magical rewriting of Venezuelan history before Chavez was elected in 1998. Now, I would argue very strongly what this has actually done is it steered the Venezuelan opposition movement, particularly during the period of Donald Trump, towards an increasingly radical perspective within which there can be no dialogue with uh, Chavez's successor, Maduro. There can be no compromise. None of these kind of notions of multilateralism or engagement, which John Shattuck was talking about the other day as being so central to this new universalized liberal democratic order. All of those things have been jettisoned by the Venezuelan opposition movement. I would argue they never actually existed. I was working in Washington DC in 2005, 2006, and I was working in Venezuela in 1998, 1999, when the Venezuelan government of Hugo Chavez was making increasingly frantic overtures to the United States, uh, to the democratic administrations of both Bill Clinton and subsequently Obama um, for dialogue, for exchange, but this was completely rejected. Madeleine Albright had barred Hugo Chavez from entering the United States of America before he was even elected. So just to reiterate, this golden era didn't really exist if you were a Latin American. So just to bring this um, increasingly frantic explanation of a very complicated and detailed period in bilateral US-Venezuelan relations, I would argue that what we need to be looking at is what is it that the Venezuelan opposition movement has offered external countries in exchange for support for regime change strategies. Now, we already know from some of the conversations that we've been able to obtain through Freedom of Information Acts, through uh, various pieces of research that my colleagues have done, that there has been discussion around, for example, Venezuela acknowledging that the Essequibo Delta, which is on the border with Guyana, the UK government has a very large interest in this. Um, there are allegations of conversations that the Venezuelan opposition has exchanged 
recognizing Essequibo as part of Guyana in order for the support of the Boris Johnson government. There are enormous um, amounts of evidence to demonstrate that many in the Venezuelan opposition who are based in Washington DC have already forged a number of agreements with people within uh, Donald Trump's government, with US financial, private and capital interests in order to in effect, what I would say is exchange support for an opportunity to invest, opportunity to gain financially if there is regime change in Venezuela. So I think this transactionalism on the part of the Venezuelan opposition helps us to understand one of the most seemingly um, complicated and difficult to engage with disconnects. And this cognitive mismatch is between, firstly, an internationally isolated, but apparently domestically credible authoritarian government in Maduro, an internationally recognized democratic opposition but which lacks grassroots and widespread domestic support in Venezuela, and also how US regime change ambitions have failed. We've had five, 10, 15, 20 years of US regime change ambitions in Venezuela. And the reason I would argue these have failed to finish is to go back to the point Shattuck made the other day, John Shattuck made the other day. There is no major appetite in the United States for foreign military deployments overseas. The danger now in this new era of transactionalism is instead of foreign military deployment overseas, we have deployment of paid mercenary organizations, private security companies, and paramilitary groups. This is created for Venezuela and for the wider region um, of the Andes, Colombia as well, very, very importantly here, a very dangerous scenario in which we see the risks of regime, regime change, of uh, efforts to overthrow a government, but with no post-conflict reconstructions in plans, no domestic legitimacy afforded to the opposition to carry out those plans, and also the conduct of a conflict that will very much be outside of the normal laws of war, because this is a new era of mercenary private interventions. So please let's take a look at transactionalism within opposition movements and not think this is just something limited to foreign governments. Sorry, I'm having trouble with my microphones. Thank you, Julia, uh, for that absolutely fascinating talk. Uh, I think it's an extremely important perspective and hopefully will generate a lot of good questions and nice to broaden the discussion. Um, this has been a really great, uh, great, great session. So I wanna thank all the presenters and the audience, of course, for being here. And I thank all the presenters for sharing their thoughts and their research with us. It's been really fascinating. And for me, with not much of a background in this, it's it's been really enlightening. So, uh, and unfortunately, you know, I, there, there's, I, I just want, I want to ask questions, but we've got a lot of questions actually um, that people have asked. And um, if everybody, if the presenters are okay with it, I'm going to go ahead and start now. There's a, a range of questions and I'm not going to just go through and bombard one person with all the questions. I'm going to mix it up so that we kind of spread the questions around amongst all the presenters a bit so that we're not just sitting and focusing that way. So, but I will first start here with uh, Marina, um, and this is a question that we, and you, by the way, for those of you watching, please feel free to continue to send in questions while we're doing this right now. Um, but it, anyway, uh, Marina, so this question is for you, uh, and uh, I'll read it now. Do you think that a different Western response to Georgia 2008 could have prevented what happened in 2014 in Ukraine? Uh, thank you very much. I think it would be logical also to take just the next question there because uh, they have the same lo logic behind, behind. The question was also, can we trace Russian assertive behavior in Syria to the lack of response in Crimea? And I'll explain why I'm taking both of them because I believe these are the links of the same chain. And uh, knowing Russian way of strategizing uh, I think uh, that uh, I, I tend to look at those events as the links of one chain, that basically uh, Georgia in 2008 was uh, the testing the grounds approach, you know, to see if West will uh, respond uh, resolutely. And when there was no such a response, uh, basically, Russia realized that there are no serious costs associated with such policies. And I think this is why Crimea uh, came in 2014. So uh, West, after Georgia and after Crimea as well, I think it concentrated mainly 
on the approach of not overreacting, of, of, of course, making the deterrence credible, but trying at the same time not to overreact. Uh, and I think this was perceived as a sign of weakness of the, the, this kind of deterrence is not credible according to the Russian reading. And Russia in recent decades tested all known counts, kinds of policies from open use of force in Georgia and Crimea and by supporting warfare in uh, Donbass. But also uh, at the moment, I think uh, what is uh, what it tends to do is to operate into some kind of gray zone where this kind of deniability, it usually resorts to uh, is in play. So trying to deny its involvement, engagement in what it, uh, where it is and what it does. And uh, basically using, uh, being under some kind of radar of attention and uh, under the threshold of, uh, of the willingness of the Western institutions to react, uh, let's say, more, more profoundly, for example, to engage militarily, for the NATO to engage uh, militarily. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I think that uh, this uh, kind of uh, a, a pacifying approach to Russia did not work, it did not succeed, and all kind of transactional approach to the Black Sea security, uh, I think it will never succeed, uh, simply because uh, these kind of moves do not reciprocate what Russia is and what Russia wants. Thank you. Thank you, Marina, for that great answer to a, to a very important question. Um, and now I will turn to Lee. Uh, so Lee, here's what question that we have here. What could ASEAN do, if anything, to keep Duterte from undermining the organization? Good, good. That's a question that I would have had as well, too. So, Yeah, um, maybe to answer that question, we should first uh, situate um, what ASEAN can do. Um, because the ASEAN has been criticized as something, as a very limited organization. It's been criticized as a talk shop where um, diplomats come together and talk, but nothing really happens on the ground. I think it also has to do with the principles of ASEAN, mainly non-interference. I mean, these are countries that have been in the past. Um, Southeast Asia has been the playground of Western powers. Um, many countries were former colonies. So one thing very important for these countries is that they maintain their sovereignty and non-interference really is very important. So what can the ASEAN do? The ASEAN can't do anything, honestly, um, to, to keep Duterte in line um, it's because it's a very limited organization as it is right now. Um, what, what it can do realistically is to continue engaging um, the Philippine diplomats because um, when Duterte falls out of line, maybe um, says something very crude, you know, he's really, um, he tends to do that a lot. Um, they can maybe uh, talk and engage diplomatically and then Duterte will later on say, uh, apologize for, for, do, for, for saying those things. Um, that's, I think, the extent of what the ASEAN can do. But what the ASEAN does effectively is at least to maintain um, this cordial relationship among the countries. Uh, the ASEAN has been uh, hailed as an organization that has maintained peace among its member countries. There has ne never really been um, any international uh, interstate conflict among ASEAN countries ever since the ASEAN existed. So it's one thing it can do good. Another thing that the ASEAN can do well is to uh, at least try to create this uh, economic community. It's, it's really more of an economic organization of Southeast Asian nations. And I think to that, in, in that extent, uh, it can really do something well. But in terms of trying to, you know, leaders uh, make them, keep them in line, I don't, I don't think there's really much ASEAN can do. Thank you, Lee, for that answer. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that's uh, it, uh, ending on a bit of a down note there, but thank you for that answer uh, to an important question. Um, and now I will go on to Cheryl. Uh, so Cheryl, we have a question here that asks, what can Western governments do to diminish the effectiveness of the criminal networks that are in their midst? Oh, you're muted, by the way, Cheryl. 
Sorry about that. Uh, that's a good question. And um, I think a lot of people would like an answer to that. And part of the reason is because they're effective. Um, they work. Um, one part I, I sliced out of the presentation was that the criminal networks and business networks merge and have created an alternate system to the Western economic system. There's, what they're saying is you don't have to do, you don't have to deal with all these complicated rules. You don't have to you don't have to uh, follow all these regulations that we're up, we that we are forcing you to do. Just we can just shake our hands and have a straightforward deal, just like the old times, and we can get business done. Um, that is a very appealing model to a lot of people, um, and so uh, that's part of it. How do uh, another aspect of this is that after nine eleven. Uh, pretty much all, there wasn't a lot of prosecutions on uh, organized crime in the US because of course everything went to terrorism. So um, a lot of the intelligence agencies started using some of these criminal organizations as sources of information. Well, that complicates matters, doesn't that? So um, uh, that's part of the problem. I would suggest that we are living in the United States with a manifestation of that process. Um, uh, we have, it has often been noted that our president has the effect of a mobster. Um, so, and has a worldview of a mobster, has, a, has people around him who are involved in organized crime. So I think it could be said that it works. So how do you fight that? It's a very, I open it up to the panel. I'd be interested to hear what everybody else says. Or if anybody has a thought on it, probably not. So do any panelists have any input into that? Because it somewhat touches into some of the areas that we've talked about a little bit. If not, we can go on to the next question. I guess not. All right, so it's an open question. If you do, if you're watching and you do have uh, you know, thoughts on that, submit it via Menti and then maybe we can bring that back for discussion if that's okay with you, Cheryl. Cool, awesome. So I will now go on. Thank you, Cheryl, for, that, for the answer to that. It's a very complex uh, situation. And now I'll turn to Julia with a provocative question here, I think, that is, do you blame the Monroe Doctrine for Chavez turning from Democrat into autocrat? Um, well, I, I just am more concerned about the fact that we have a document that was written in 1820, which is still being cited today by Mike Pompeo in uh, in his discussions with Latin American countries. I mean, it's shocking. It's a shambles. Um, it's not so much the Monroe Doctrine per se. It's what flows from the Monroe Doctrine. And what flows from the Monroe Doctrine is that Latin American countries are not considered equal by the United States. Uh, this is very much a hub and spoke relationship. Very different, I think, from what uh, Lee uh, it's talking about um, in terms of ACN's working relations and very different from what we see in the European Union. Um, and I think, you know, it's it's the institutions that flow from the Monroe Doctrine as well, particularly in the post-war period, such as the Organization of American States, which um, for a number of Latin American countries isn't representative of the will of the Latin American people. It's something that's very much controlled um, financed and directed by the United States. Um, so it's less me blaming the Monroe Doctrine for, for Chavez apparently moving from being a Democrat to being an authoritarian. Um, I think what was the um, driver of an increasingly anti-democratic trend in the Chavez government, specifically after 2006, um, was more a reaction against an opposition movement, um, which was very much founded and predicated um, engaging with the fundamentals and agreement with the Monroe Doctrine. So I think that's the way I'd understand it. Thank you, Julia, for that answer, uh, which I think goes right to the heart of the question. Uh, now to go back to Marina. Um, and so this question here is for Marina again. Uh, to what extent should states, to what extent should states accept the bad behavior of other states, such as bullies, in order to prevent war and save lives in the short term? Very interesting question, given, given the prevalence of bullies right now on the international stage. Yeah, I, I think it might depend on the context. Uh, from the context I'm familiar with, I'm working on the Black Sea region, I think uh, that uh, this is the region that where currently we have 
the the security in its very very realpolitik military understanding. So this this part of the world and the further the, so, the more so. So this part of the world is stuck in this kind of power games and zero sum plays. So I think that uh, according to this logic, uh, all kind of uh, concessions might be uh, considered by the hegemons, which is here in the region in this context is Russian Federation as a sign of uh, as a sign of weakness. And I think it doesn't work here that accepting bullies will prevent war as it's uh, written in this question. I think it does not prevent war. It uh, prolongs the unnecessary sufferings of the civilians. I, I can cite here the, the case of Donbass, where more than 13,000 people died from the onset of the conflict. Uh, so uh, I think uh, that this is, uh, this is not really a strategy that uh, prevents, uh, prevents uh, war. And uh, I think this kind of behavior needs to be uh, seriously addressed in a different way rather than just accepting and putting up with. Thank you, Marina, for that very clear answer about the, the question. And, you know, it's so applicable to everyday, everyday life when we encounter bullies. You know, the more we tolerate the bullies, the more they make everybody's life miserable, including our own. So thank you for that broadly applicable answer. Um, and now I will turn back to you, Lee. Um, so here's the question for you. Can transactional diplomacy by member states in ASEAN drive and ASEAN drive for centrality coexist to balance amid great power rivalries in the region? Yeah, I think uh, it really is coexisting. There's no other way to deal with it anyway. Uh, the way that that the transactionalist foreign policy works is that he responds to issues when it comes, doesn't really have any, any sort of foresight to say, to say the least. Uh, so when when Southeast uh, what, I mean, yeah, uh, when the South South China Sea aggression started, particularly coming from China, what happened was Duterte suddenly had to revive revitalize U.S. relationship, uh, U.S. and Philippine relationship because it really can't do anything. So it it's it, it kind of bends different uh, sways different ways depending on what it needs at the moment, which is not really the way to do things but it's, it's a response to what is needed at that moment, which I think that's, that's one of the things that really dilutes ASEAN centrality in the region. So yes, I think it will coexist because there's no other way to do it anyway. Uh, but the thing is, things could, could even be better if Duterte stops, be, uh, stops this uh, focus on short-term short gains because he really enjoys uh, an unprecedented popularity in the Philippines, 80% according to recent surveys. And if he can use that mandate well, he can actually create um, change in the way that um, the Philippines has been handling situation, particularly in the South China Sea. But as it stands right now, and he, I think, really is very particular in trying to maintain cordial relationships with China, he's still really very careful in his words when he criticizes China. So I hope I answered the question. Thank you, Lee. That's, uh, you know, it's a it's a tough situation, and like you said, you know, you said, uh, what sometimes what can you do but balance things or try to seek some sort of balance, you know, uh, sometimes. Um, okay, so we will go on to Cheryl. Thanks, Lee, for that answer. Um, this is somewhat related to the question before Cheryl. Uh, so, and the question here is: Should Russian organized crime be treated as a criminal or intelligence challenge by the West? And how effectively do you think the West is handling that threat? Uh, and you're muted again. Sure. Um, I think it has been used, uh, has been treated as both a law enforcement and uh, intelligence threat, um, partly because, as I said, organized crime is used as a foreign policy tool by Russia. For example, during the 2000s, um, many of the energy deals that Russia made throughout the region were with the assistance or through very opaque, allegedly mob-linked intermediary com countries, uh, companies, uh, the most important or 
one of the most notable was in Ukraine. Um, that led to a lot of um, complications for Ukraine and the U.S. Or the, so in my view, the U.S. was, the, it was a battle of soft powers where it was the mob on one side and the Western organizations on the other trying to battle for the soul of, of Ukraine without hard power. Um, now, um, that led to issues such as the gas being cut off in 2005 um, or 2006, et cetera. So how do you deal with that? You have to deal with it as a law enforcement matter, as a criminal, uh, as a intelligence issue, but also as a foreign policy issue. And in the end, did the West win? I'm not sure. All I'll say is that, uh, well, that's, that's all I'll say. Thank you, Cheryl, for that. Uh, you know, again, you know, your topic is such a such a one that has so many very different variables. It makes it difficult, oftentimes, to be have you know concrete answers, as as many of these <laughs> subjects do. Um, yes. So I've got uh, a question now here for thank you for that, by the way, for Julia. Um, to what extent has the Venezuelan crisis been overlooked or forgotten by the international community, given the COVID crisis, Trump, Russia? Etc. So a question about our global attention spans. Uh, well, I guess that depends on which part of the Venezuelan crisis you're interested in. Um, I don't think Venezuela's crisis has been forgotten. It's certainly not been forgotten by the United Nations or the European Union, which have both recently called again for the United States to lift the sanctions on Venezuela. Um, on this point, I'd just like to take issue with some of the uh, points that were, were raised in the opening session uh, with Michael Ignatieff and John Shattuck and Ned Temko, where there was a lot of discussion about sanctions and the use of sanctions to bring these deviant states back into the uh, international fold of human rights and the rule of law. Sanctions have not worked in Venezuela, just like sanctions haven't worked in Cuba. Um, what sanctions have done to Venezuela is compounded an existing crisis of massive mismanagement by the Maduro government, um, resulting in a, in a severe humanitarian uh, pr crisis for, for a large number of Venezuelan citizens. Um, these US sanctions started off on individuals in 2017, and now they impact the oil economy, the gold sector, financial transactions. Um, they've been multilateralized, they've been transnationalized. Anybody doing any business with the Venezuelan state now faces the risk of sanctions. What this has done is it's strengthened the esprit de corps in the Venezuelan elite, um, and it's inflicted enormous social suffering on Venezuelan people. Um, so I'd certainly say no, the uh, Venezuelan crisis hasn't been forgotten. The challenge is just how we kind of work our way through this. And we are content, I say we, with uh, colleagues of mine in Europe and Latin America, carry on working very, very hard to try and get a dialogue process going. But every time we seem to get a dialogue process going, uh, this gets snatched away at the last minute because of, you know, the opposition say it's the Maduro government won't negotiate, the Maduro government says it's the opposition won't negotiate. But we had a very interesting development here yesterday, which will be my final point on this, which is the Bank of England, uh, some of you may have seen, declined to return $800 million worth of, uh, of gold to the United States. Sorry, Freudian slip to Venezuela, to return 800 million pounds worth, a billion dollars worth of gold to Venezuela. Um, and this is on the basis they don't recognize Maduro as the government, they only recognize Juan Guaido. Um, and Guaido's team have said that this money when it's released, uh, this gold when it's released will not be going towards humanitarian efforts in Venezuela, um, which is what uh, some sections of the opposition have been lobbying for, for these funds to be released so that they can support humanitarian aid. Guaido's team have said that's not gonna be the case. So if you're interested in transactional foreign policy, what some of us are looking at right now is what's going to happen with this $800 million worth of, of gold revenues. Um, because in terms of transactionalism, we've, we've seen a lot of uh, Venezuelan money in the United States uh, has seemingly been going into constructing U.S. walls between the U.S. and uh, Mexico, which is particularly interesting in the context of USAID having cut its financial support to Central American countries because they're failure to control migration to the U.S. and instead redirected that money for Central America to Wang Guaido's interim opposition government. So if you want an example of transactionalism in terms of foreign policy and opposition organizations, um, COVID hasn't hidden or buried any of the realities of those, how those carry on and if, if anything are exacerbated by conditions of COVID because right now there's a lot of people thinking this is the best time to push for Maduro's replacement. Thank you for that great answer, you know, and always a, a, a reminder that just because it's not in the news doesn't mean it's not happening. You know, and not just the front page is a very small slice of things. 
Um, I do see that we are almost at the end of the session. So I wanted to ask a question that's been addressed to all of you uh, here. And so the question for all of you is, is, says John Shattuck and Ned Temko in the opening said that there is cause for optimism because of COVID and mass protests. Do you see this in the areas you work on? And I, and I think for the order, we'll just go, you know, Marina, Lee, Cheryl, and Julie, just the same presentation order that we've been on. So Marina, you'll be up first for that, that question. Um, do you, again, is there cause for optimism in the areas you work on because of COVID and the mass protests? Uh, if to apply this to the Black Sea region, I don't think that, uh, I mean, COVID just exacerbated the, the domestic tensions in the countries. We see the dire situation in Russia. I mean, uh, in, in Ukraine, this is, uh, this is really the state that uh, put lots of its efforts recently integrating with, uh, with the European Union, trying to aspire for the NATO membership and physically cut from Schengen uh, from with the visa free regime, it's so uh, strongly fought for and enjoyed for the last several years. So COVID created again, uh, so these barriers, they resurfaced physically even, uh, that thousands of Ukrainians are cut from just traveling, traveling to the EU. And of course the domestic uh, repercussions, since this is a really tough times for the uh, let's say emerging democracies and uh, Ukraine currently is in, the, in this situation where the new government uh, and the president Zelensky they, they, they need to kind of to, to keep afloat under the Russian aggression and under the international pressure and in economic uh, downturn and simply COVID makes it all very 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 complicated and I believe this this applies to each and all countries of the region South Caucasus it's the same, even though they are doing better there in terms of, of, of COVID, uh, Georgia in particular, uh, Turkey and uh, Romania, Bulgaria uh, as well. So I see really those kind of divisions. And uh, I mean, the situation is not uh, better, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. And uh, maybe we'll have Lee now answer. It's a very interesting question, actually, because um, as I mentioned in my presentation, China has taken advantage of the situation by trying to um, increase its militarization in South China Sea. Um, and the Philippines and Indonesia, the natural uh, traditional leaders of Southeast Asia, are currently um, in the midst of a very difficult time because of the rising cases. So it really can't lead the ASEAN in trying to um, create deterrence and in the area, but Vietnam, Vietnam's very good response to COVID allows it to um, be able to try to fight back. And uh, uh, coincidentally, Vietnam is also the chair of the ASEAN this year. So they are trying to really, uh, they have an ax to grind against China and they're really trying to maximize their leadership of the ASEAN and, and try to, uh, 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 try to uh, balance uh, the powers in the area. Um, but in the case of the Philippines, I guess with COVID and Protests. Protests are also happening uh, in the Philippines, particularly online. And since many people are online right now, you know, the Philippines has the most active social media in the world. I think we're currently up to 70 million uh, users on Facebook alone. And there's been an increase, I believe, I, I, I hope I'm not speaking on behalf of the echo chamber I have created being very fiercely anti-Duterte. Uh, but uh, I think there is a brewing um, mass protests following the signing of the anti-terror bill today. So it's definitely a very interest, interesting time for scholars of Southeast Asian studies and, and Philippines actually to be alive because there's gonna be a lot of big changes coming in the near future. Thank you, Lee and uh, Cheryl. Oh, Cheryl, you're muted. Do uh, I'm going to speak as an American with a, let's say, mob style leader um, who uh, has done a lot of business with Russian organizations and persons, and some of which are uh, deeply embedded with organized crime. I'm going to say as an American that uh, the failures of 
uh, the transaction, uh, a transactional approach is apparent in the fact that we need a uh, government has to be functioning. And right now the US does not have a fully functioning government as is highlighted by COVID. So thus the, the transactional approach was, which is just, I'll give you a rising stock market and you don't have to, you don't have to do anything else is not good enough. Also, I'll say that the, the protests in the US and elsewhere show that we aspire for more than a mere transactional approach. We want more as, as humans, we all do. These protests have happened throughout the world. So simply seeing each other as check uh, pawns on a, on, a, on a board are not enough. We aspire for community and we want a functional government. So I think that's, uh, that's the, it shows the limitations of the transactional approach and of uh, people who are affiliated with criminal organizations who can lead governments. That's all I'll say. Thank you for that great answer. Uh, and last but not least, Julia. Um, well, have mass protests. Should we be optimistic? If you follow Venezuela, no. Um, I was covering mass protests in Venezuela before Chavez came to power, and I've done nothing but cover mass protests uh, for the last 20 years. Um, and they've had no impact. Um, so I think this notion of mass process as a driver of change is, is something which is very kind of North American, uh, West European. It's certainly not something that I'm necessarily seeing in, in Venezuela and uh, maybe the wide Latin American context, but certainly not in Venezuela. And I, I would finish with one point, which is um, I think this, this kind of looking to mass protests as a way of trying to recapture the lost human rights agendas and universalisms of the 1990s actually is a product of the failures of that liberalism of the 1990s. Because I think what we saw then was this reification of civil society and the downgrading and the demolition of unions and various forms of organization. Maybe Cheryl, this links with the point that you're raising. Um, but civil society and this reification of mass protests and mass organizations was never an adequate substitute for things like trade union organizations, working men's and women's associations. Those were the fundamentals. Go back to David Putnam, read what democracy was built on. Mass protests is no solution. It's just the end consequence of liberal internationalism of the 1990s. Great way to end the, the, the final set of questions. Um, and first, I want to acknowledge to everybody watching, you know, there was a bunch of questions that we just couldn't get to uh, because of the issue of uh, with time. So I really encourage you if you have the, there are great questions. I really encourage you if you have these questions to individually reach out to the people who are to our speakers here. As a speaker in other conferences, I always love it when somebody emails me and says, hey, I had a question. It's super cool. It's nice. And, you know, you, you build a relationship, a connection that you might know, never know where it might go. Uh, intellectually or in terms of professional dynamics and so on. So I really encourage you to reach out. Everybody here is super nice and they'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Um, and again, I apologize that we couldn't get to all of them. I want to thank all the speakers here today for making the time to come and talk. What well, was absolutely fascinating panel. I really wish we could have all had like a, also an informal discussion with this about this very interesting topic. So, I, you know, I'm sorry we couldn't get to that, but thank you to each of the speakers, to Marina, Lee, Cheryl and Julia for being here. Thanks to Hakam, Kirsten and Ben for putting together a fantastic event. This was awesome. Um, I loved sharing it. I loved listening to all the talks and the questions were great. So it was like one of these events where you had everything go right and the inter no internet problems, fantastic. Um, I want to invite you. The last question, you know, was this about, you know, the impact of COVID on the areas that, that each of our speakers are working on which is a wonderful segue into our next session starting in about half an hour at 4 p.m. Central European time on transactional foreign policy and the global response to and implications of COVID-19. So if you, if you, if these, if you know, if there wasn't enough time for, uh, to, you know, to get all the answers you wanted about COVID-19 with this topic, then I really encourage you to just wait. It's just 20 minutes. It's not a big deal. Get a snack, come back and join us for the next session. And again, thank you to everybody for a wonderful uh, event and to everybody at home who's sitting and watching. watching. And I really wish you all a, a wonderful next session and a great weekend. Thank you again. Thank you.